God's voice. How many would like God to talk to you about something or another? Precious God, in the name of Jesus, we ask you now in Jesus' name to guide us and direct us. Let the word of the Lord find a lodging place in our hearts. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. All right, smile at somebody nearby. My pastor used to always say, is everybody happy? Never forgot that. Is everybody happy? Uh, so we're talking about hearing God's voice. How many has ever been guilty of hearing but not listening? I've been accused of that a time or two in my day. You're not listening. How many's ever talked to someone in a conversation and you can tell they're not listening? All they're doing is waiting for you to shut up so they can say what they want to say. If we're going to hear from God, we must practice the art of being an active listener. When you come prepared to listen, the, the people that are doing the speaking recognize that. Here's a little tip. When the boss on the job calls for a meeting, Bring a pen and something to write on. Even if they don't say anything worth remembering, just the fact that you're ready to go communicates to them that you're paying attention. I threw that in for free. That might get you a promotion one day. You never know. But if... And we can all do this. We can make the mistake. Preachers are the worst. I gave up on telling other preachers what I preached last week. They don't care. They're ready to tell me what they've been preaching about. And we can get distracted by concentrating on anything. My wife could be teaching a less whole series on this. She's a natural, active listener. It's a gift. A lot of us have to learn how to pay attention. She has it by nature. But not only does active listening involve paying attention, but it also involves reading nonverbal cues, body language the emotional state of the individual that's communicating what they have to say. In the altar, if somebody's in a state of repentance, we should give them plenty of space to repent with tears, remorse, making commitments to God, and not rush them past that moment. But sometimes in our zeal, we can be so zealous for another one to get the Holy Ghost that we missed another one repenting of their sins. And I will say that if you get the Holy Ghost somehow without a thorough repentance, the chances are it's not going to stick because repentance is foundational. So active listening requires that we pay attention to emotional cues. We need to learn how to read the body language of the individual doing the talking and to maintain eye contact without getting weird. <laughs> Another skill when it comes to um, active listening is you have to follow the person that's doing the talking. 
By that I mean, and my wife has told me this, and I received it. Don't interrupt somebody mid-sentence because you thought of something that you're worried you might forget to tell them. Let them say everything they need to say, and silence is okay so that they can finish their thought, give space for them to complete everything they need to say. Because something is very frustrating, and if you have ever felt like you haven't been heard, it's just like, what do you do? You can't hit the guy or girl. Third skill in active listening. This is the thing about God. Let me tell you this about when it comes to following. Um, a lot of times our prayer is us doing all the talking and almost zero listening. After you have talked your heart out to God, you need to give space for some silence so that the Spirit of God can talk to you because the Holy Ghost is a gentleman. He's not going to interrupt He's going to let you say what you want to say. But if you just quit the minute you're done talking, is it any wonder that we don't hear what we want to hear? Just sit sometimes in silence for 15 minutes. Give God. It isn't that God can't say anything yet. It's that you can't receive it yet. And we have to find the signal that God is sending our way. The third skill in active listening is called reflecting. If you really want someone who's conversing with you to be assured that you've heard what they said, reflecting is when they finish, you give a brief recap of what they said to you, not, in, not quoting identical words and phrases, but let them know you have the general idea of what they just talked about so that they can, especially if it's instructional in nature, so that they know that you know that they were understood. Praise God. And uh, so what is going on here in Hebrews? Well, the writer of Hebrews, presumably Paul, we don't know for sure, but presumably Paul, was, uh, was citing a time referred to as the day of provocation. Well, the day of provocation was when Israel just completely forgot everything that God promised them and acted as if God did not exist in their circumstance. They went out and sent spies into the land of promise, and they came back with a report. Ten of them gave an evil report out of 12 and said, yeah, there are grapes, yeah, big as your fist. Yeah, there are uh, fields that, uh, that are ripe with harvest. Yes, it flows with milk and honey. But there's giants in the land. And so we can't take them. We can't go there. And you know the story. But that offended God so much that he marked that day in the calendar. And it's called the day of provocation where they provoked God to such anger that an entire generation lost their lives wandering in the wilderness because they uh, were reluctant. This problem starts with Israel when Moses went on the mountain. Remember when they told Moses, you go up and listen to what God says and you tell us what God says. We don't want to hear it. That's a reluctant hearer. No wonder they misunderstood. No wonder they downplayed God's role in the conquest of the promised land and offended him so. They, they weren't listening uh, to what God wanted them to say. So we needed to be able to distinguish. Notice the instruction. If you hear his voice and harden not your hearts. So we need to be able to distinguish between God's voice and our voice. How many's ever had a little trouble with that? Is this me talking to me? Is this God talking to me? 
Is this the devil talking to me? Turn to your neighbor and say, you're hearing things. Every one of us got some voices going on all the time. This may shock you and it may not. The same mechanism that the devil uses to speak temptation to you. How many knows what it's like when the enemy comes in and uses the power of suggestion to tell you to do something you know you shouldn't do? Guess what? That's the same mechanism that you hear the voice of God with. Why is it that we can hear the, the voice of temptation? Why is it that we can hear discouraging remarks from the powers of darkness so easily? But yet it's such a challenge to hear the voice of God. Why is that? It might have something to do with the hardness of our hearts. And so listen to what Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8 says. Now Adam and Eve has disobeyed God. They have partaken of the forbidden fruit. And they heard the voice of the Lord walking. Didn't say they heard the footsteps of the Lord walking. It said they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and Eve hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. How do you hear the voice of someone walking? Well, if you're a desperate parent and you're looking for a missing kid in the mall and you're calling out their name, you can almost feel the pulse of the footsteps in the vibration of the voice because the desperation... God had two missing children on his hands and he wanted to know what happened to them. And he's calling and they hear the pulse of his footstep as he's calling. Adam, where are thou? Whew. So each and one of us knows what that feels like. Our kids have probably heard that same pulse at some point in their I, if you are raised a child and you never suddenly panicked because you didn't know where they were, you've done a pretty good job. Most of us weren't quite that successful. Thank God we found them. So I want to talk about distinguishing our voice from God's voice for a few minutes. First of all, remember this about your voice. It's egocentric. I know, that's a big word. How about this one? God's voice is sociocentric or theocentric. I'll explain what I mean by this. Ego has to do with the I in me. So egocentrism refers to somebody's inability to understand the possibility of anyone else having an opinion other than their own. All they see is what they think things should be like, and they cannot grasp the possibility that someone else can have a good point of view as well. That's egocentrism. That's when the, the filter is the I in me. Everything relates to me, Myself and I. Is it not true that when the voice comes into your head that is concerned with one thing and one thing alone as how this affects me, chances are that's not God's voice, that's you talking to you. All right? So remember that. An egocentric mindset has the tendency to recreate God in their own image. Beware of an idea about God 
where he agrees with you 100% of the time on every conceivable topic, chances are that's not a theocentric view. That's not a God-centered worldview. That's an ego-centered worldview. You've just cast God into your own image. All right? You don't want to do that. You want a God that disagrees with you once in a while. <laughs> you want a God that challenges you once in a while, calls you out. Okay, so uh, a theocentric, God's voice is theocentric. It's God-centered. It puts God in the middle of everything. It's a God-first word. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. I dare say, if we blindfolded everybody, most of us in this room have been exposed to each other long enough that if they called out to you from across the room and you couldn't see them, you could identify them by their voice print. We should become familiar enough with God that we recognize him by his voice print. I know what Jackie sounds like. Come on, I know what Misha sounds like. Come on, I know what Bryce is. I know what Mama, I know what Jonathan's. I could I don't have to see you. I could just hear the sound of your voice. Not only that, if you recognize someone's voice print, you can hear their voice and not understand the words that they're saying and know it's them calling you. Sometimes I hear God, but I don't know exactly. I can't discern all the details, but I know that God is calling. God is speaking. And that I need to slow down and pay attention and give God a chance. All right? Your voice, ready for this? Your voice is comforting. There was a certain rich man, his... Uh, Harvest produced goods year after year. He built barns, and he said, I got to tear down these barns, and I got to build greater barns because this surplus of stuff come up, and then I'm going to just take it easy, and I'm going to eat, and I'm going to drink, and I'm going to take it easy. But what he didn't know was that was the last night of his life. And his soul was going to be required of him. Remember this about your voice. It, it's comfortable to you. But God's voice is a comforter. Oh, well, that's just semantics. What's the difference between comfortable and comforter? The word comforter is paraclete. 3875, parakletos, from the word para, meaning close beside, like, you know, paramedic. And from the word keleo, which means a call. So properly, a paraclete is a legal advocate who makes the right judgment call because they are close enough to the situation. And then Strong goes on to give the analogy. It's like someone representing you in the court of law who stands up and says, Objection, Your Honor! They come in and they stand for you. See, a comforter doesn't just ease you into inaction, but a comforter comes to your side when you're in the middle of a crisis of obedience. So your voice puts you to sleep. But God's voice comes to you in the time of crisis of obedience and said, you're not alone. I'm here with you. Hold on. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And so I read an article. I think it was from the Telegraph was the name of the newspaper. I copied just a piece of it. A, a preacher and his lawyer friend were in an airport in Alaska preparing to buy tickets to get on a commercial airplane to take them back home. Well, a 
private pilot was behind them and suggested, said, guys, I'm headed where you're going. I have my own plane. I could save you a ton of money. Why don't you guys just get on my plane with me and I'll take you to the very airport you want to go. So they looked at each other and they said, okay, let's go. So they boarded his small plane. A few hours into the journey, a cloud cover came in, the weather turned bad, and the pilot became grievously ill. So ill, he passed out at the controls. Neither one of these other two knew anything about flying a plane. They tried to revive him. They tried to shake him. They tried to wake him. No result. So, so the, the, the preacher shoved the guy out of the seat and gave the mic calm to his buddy and said, start hollering for help. And so he just starts saying, you know, Mayday, help, help, our pilot's, our pilot's down, he's unconscious, help. And some commercial uh, freighter plane got on there and said, hey, you guys novices, don't you understand, you know, airline protocol? No, we don't know how to fly a plane. We've lost our pilot. We're going to die. And so this fellow told them how to contact the Anchorage uh, air traffic control. So now here... He's got the guy in the back is with the mic talking to the aircraft control and speaking to the one trying to fly the plane. So there we are now. They were literally headed into a mountain. Had they not gotten the air traffic control on the line, they would have hit the mountain. The title of the article is Saved by a Voice. After explaining the pilot was unconscious and the freighter pilot started giving them instructions and finally got them in contact with the Anchorage Airport Tower, that air traffic controller was very calm and gave them simple instructions on how to turn the plane around. They were headed straight towards a mountain. He repeated certain things over and over. Ready for this? He said, listen to my voice. Don't look at the storm outside. In your panic, there will be voices in your head telling you to do this or that. Don't listen to them. Listen only to my voice. You can't see me, but I can see you. As they flew near to the Anchorage Air Traffic uh, Anchorage Airport, the air traffic controller described the landing zone and the lights in the shape of a cross on the runway, step by step. That pastor landed that plane after seven attempts to land. He finally brought it down, and both of them survived the ordeal because there was a voice. That voice was a paraclete. That voice was an advocate. Can I tell you, when you need to listen for God's voice, when serving him has gotten you into a dilemma, hallelujah, your voice will say, give up, panic, go berserk, blame people. But the voice of God will say, listen only to me. Don't look to the right. Don't look to the left. I can see you even if you can't see me. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. I'm glad there's a voice in the crisis hour. So thirdly, your voice agrees with you. God's voice agrees with his word. How do I tell my voice from God's voice? First of all, put it up against the word of God. God's voice agrees with his word. And so it reminds me of an old commercial. Probably have to be a baby boomer or better to appreciate this. Remember the commercial that Star Kiss Tuna had with Charlie the Tuna? How many remembers old Charlie? He was slick. He had his uh, smoking jacket on. He was, he was debonair. He, 
He thought Starkist wanted tuna with good taste. So he was like, you know, English royalty at your service. And, and, but what Charlie the Tuna didn't realize, Starkist didn't want tuna with good taste. They wanted tuna that tasted good. Christians want God to make good sense. Good luck with that. Sometimes God doesn't make good sense. I don't want to be a Christian who only follows a God who makes good sense. I want to be a Christian that wants to sense God good. Because sometimes God will ask you to step out of the boat and walk on water. That doesn't make good sense. But if you can sense God good, then you can say, nevertheless, at your word, here I come, Jesus. And the next thing you know, you're defying gravity and physics and everything else because God is working a miracle in your experience. Hallelujah. Woo! So remember this. Every one of us is going to go through a wilderness phase in our lives. And wildernesses don't make much sense. But before God can do something in our life, he has to take us outside of our life. Sort of like Joseph. Before he can put him in the palace, he's got to take him out of the house, into the pit, into the prison, That's wilderness living. That doesn't make any sense at all. But what God is doing is developing a man who will probably have compassion on his brothers. Imagine if he had slaughtered all of his brothers. How could God have propagated uh, the future of Israel with the loss of all those brothers and all, all, all of that? He wanted reconciliation. What about Moses? Before Moses could challenge Pharaoh and say, let my people go, he had to go and spend 40 years wandering on the backside of the desert, forgotten. When the time, see, God has to take, sometimes God has to take you out of yourself to put you back into your life. John the Baptist doesn't come from downtown Jerusalem. He doesn't come from Rome. He doesn't come from Greece. He comes from the desert. And he comes as a forerunner of Jesus, and he says, there's one coming after me who's mightier than I. Everybody repent and get ready for the coming of the Lord. So I want to tell you, God is in the business of bringing us through processes. And when we're in our wilderness, he's developing things in us that will work to our advantage, and that will actually make your life better. you got to listen to him and listen for him. When you hear your voice, it's oftentimes laced with fear and uncertainty. How many has ever had the Holy Ghost speak to you and say, I'm scared? How about you? (laughs) That's all it would take for me to go, oh, my Lord. Where is that in the Bible? Every time God speaks, he says, fear not. When you hear God's voice, it's filled with power and love and sound-mindedness. Fear and uncertainty, that's not the voice of God. Power, love, sound-mindedness, that's the voice of God. Now let's look at the devil's voice versus the Lord's voice. That's always a good place to go. Both of them reference the word of God all the time. I've never had the devil quote me Shakespeare. Maybe you have. But I sure enough have had him bring me scriptures. Satan uses the Bible to cause confusion. God is the author of the Bible, but God is not the author of confusion. He said to Eve, did God really say? 
that you can't eat of every tree? Didn't God? Did he, you said you could eat of every tree. Those were his famous words. He said, eat it all. So he uses God's word to confuse us. God uses his word to bring us clarity and direction. I love the way Jesus responds to the devil. It is written, thou shalt serve the Lord thy God. It is written, thou shalt uh, not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. God uses his word to give you clarity, not confusion. Does that make sense? Satan will use the scripture to get us to mismanage divine resources. He'll tell you if you need a job, just sit around and pray all day. The Lord would probably say something like this. Start by sitting down and praying, then get up and go online and search. All right, I'll get to some more of that in a minute. But when he told the Lord, he said, cast yourself down from off this temple because the Bible says that the Lord will cause the angels to pick you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. He said that, didn't he? Just throw yourself down. Psalm 91 was what he was quoting, verse 11 and 12. It reads like this. If you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you, no disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Notice Psalm 91 is when you're come under attack by the enemy and it tells you that you're going to walk all over the devil, not jump off the church. It guards you against where you walk, not where you jump. What is the difference between a premeditated uh, 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 problem, a crime, and an accidental one? Take an accident in a car. Has anyone ever been in an accident? That's all? I'm going to get you on this one. Has anyone hit someone and then took off? I didn't think it better not. You want to know why? It's not an accident anymore. What could be an ordinary accident can turn into a felony. All you have to do is leave the scene of the accident. There's a difference between what is accidental and what is premeditated. The devil wanted to use the Jesus to mismanage the resources of heaven for a premeditated act. Throw yourself off the building and, and energize the angels. They wouldn't have been there for him had that have happened because that wasn't what they were designated for. Praise God. Finally, Satan uses scripture to challenge your identity. God uses scriptures to confirm your identity. When the voice says you're a nothing, you're a nobody, you don't count, that's not God talking to you like that. The voice of God says you're blood bought. You're kings and priests. You're royal priesthood. You're bought with a price. You're saved by grace. Amen. He challenged Jesus twice with his sonship. If you're the son of if you're the son of God. We know how Jesus treated that kind of, uh, of an approach. Satan uses the word of God to get you to doubt yourself. God uses his word to help you humble yourself. 
That's a good place to wrap things up. Humility is one of the most misunderstood things in, the, in people's minds. Sometimes saints equate humility with poor self-esteem. Big mistake. Humility has nothing to do with poor self-esteem. Humility is, is seeing yourself not better than anyone else, okay? When you're humble, you don't look across the room and say, I'm better than they are. Poor self-esteem looks across the room and says, they're better than me. God wants you to humble yourself. Satan wants you to hate yourself. Humility is open to feedback and criticism. Low self-esteem is closed. Oh, no. You're not telling me nothing. I won't hear it. A humble person does not need affirmation of the multitudes, right? Because they get their affirmation from God. But someone with poor self-esteem needs people to tell them how great they are all the time because they hate themselves. So it's, the word of God teaches us to be humble. We humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and he will raise us up. I want to be able to discern that voice from God. A humble person recognizes their strengths. A person with the low self-esteem focuses on their weaknesses. Whew. The devil wants you to focus on what you can't do, who you can't be, how you can't win, how the battle is too strong, how that life is too tough. The Lord wants you to do like Paul. I can do all all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Why don't we stand and lift our hands to the Lord right now? Hallelujah. Praise God. And finally, Satan uses the word of God to condemn you. God uses the word of God to convict you. What is the difference between condemnation and conviction? Condemnation is fatalistic. Condemnation is defeatism. Condemnation breeds hopelessness and despair. Conviction says, you're better than that. That's not the you I have in mind. You can rise above that. Come on, somebody. The devil wants to use the word to condemn you. Spirit of God wants to use the word to convict you in a challenge so that you can rise and become the person God has planned for you to be. Why don't we lift our hands right now and let's thank him. Thank him for the spirit of Why don't we just feel after him right now for a second before we go. Precious Lord, in the name of Jesus, help us, God, to be able to discern the voice of God, to hear the voice of God in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you for your presence, Lord. We thank you for your power and spirit, God. You're worthy of the highest praise, O Lamb of God. We bless you right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We need a word from you, Lord. We need to hear from you. Precious God, precious God. We want to listen to your voice, only to your voice. Not to our voice, not to the voice of the enemy. Especially when we're in a crisis. Your voice will be our paraclete, our comforter, our advocate, our SOS, our emergency help, our rescuer. In the mighty name of Jesus, hallelujah, 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 precious God, in Jesus' name. We thank you for your presence, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you're in a state of emergency, take time to let God talk you through it and talk you out of it in Jesus name. God bless you. Shake hands. Bless your neighbor. Listen for the voice of God.